Immutability is one of the core concepts in functional programming. When we are talking about mutability, we imply mutable or immutable objects. So, what does it mean for an object to be immutable? It means that such an object doesn't mutate or change, in other words, its internal state. Junior developers often get confused when hear about immutability for the first time. Indeed, how is it possible to implement an, an immutable type? However, any c -sharp developer can recall that the string type is actually immutable. When you change a string instance, you get a new modified string instance as a result. The initial instance, the original one, stays unchanged. This is immutability in essence. Ok then, let's look at a very simple code snippet. Here is the character class. Is this class immutable? No, of course not. This class is mutable. The hit method mutates the internal state. It changes the value of the health property. We can't say that this is a very bad piece of code. However, we can make it better. We can make it immutable automatically, making it safe for concurrent access at least. Actually, the benefits are more profound and you'll see that later. So, how to make this type immutable? Easily. Look at this. The hit method now returns a new instance on each call. It doesn't mutate the internal state anymore. This is exactly how the string type is implemented. Well, actually not exactly, but similarly. Let's look at another example which demonstrates how mutability reduces readability. The first class we see here is called Rectangle. This type is mutable since the scale method mutates the internal state, the width and height properties. The next type we have here is called Ellipse and it takes a rectangle instance in its constructor. It takes the rectangle to draw itself around that rectangle. We don't have a full-blown implementation since it doesn't matter from the learning perspectives. And now is the most interesting thing. Let's look at the client's code. Logically, the caller at first creates an instance of the rectangle type. Var rect equals new rectangle passing say 10 and 20 as the arguments and now the caller should create an instance of the ellipse type so we write ellipse el equals new ellipse passing that rectangle instance and now let's scale the rectangle by the factor of 2. Aha! Uh -huh. Interesting. Looks nice. Looking only at this piece of client's code, can you understand what will happen to the ellipse after scaling the rectangle? Seems like we mutate the internal state of the rectangle instance. But will the size of the ellipse change correspondingly? Hmm. This example demonstrates how mutability reduces the readability. Let's look at how we can improve design of this toy example. I'll copy and paste this example into a new source file and change it.
To make the rectangle immutable, we can do the same trick we've done to the character type. Let's look at how the client's code change. Aha! Uh -huh. Now we see that the scale method returns a new instance of the rectangle type. That, of course, means that the ellipse stays unchanged. Since the internal state of the rectangle type obviously stays unchanged in the first place. That is a small, but a very important improvement, which increases readability and improves the predictability of the program's behavior. Let's look in the next lecture how to defeat the problem of temporal coupling by enforcing immutability. This is a second part which demonstrates the problem of temporal coupling from another angle, from the angle of immutability. In object-oriented and functional programming, an immutable object, unchangeable object, is an object whose state cannot be modified after it is created. This is in contrast to a mutable object, changeable object, which can be modified after it's created. Immutable objects are usually comprised of so-called pure functions, which do not cause side effects. In other words, they do not change the state of the object. And surprisingly, temporal coupling depends on immutability. Let's look at the problem more closely. Here is an example which demonstrates the problem. This class takes the board size and player's name as the arguments in the start method, and the most interesting goes in the start method's body. Firstly, it creates an object of the player type by calling the createPlayer method, passing in the player name. Right after that, it calls the createBoard method, passing in the board size to create an object of type board. If you look at the createBoard method, you'll notice that it also passes in the constructor, the player object. In the end, it calls the startGame method, which creates the game object passing to its constructor, the board object, and finally calls the start method. I wrote such functions as the start function many times myself. What's wrong with it? The thing is that all the three functions are coupled in a sense of call sequence. You have to keep the calls right in the order they are now. Unfortunately, nothing protects us from rearranging them. I can easily swap calls like this. Or like this. Done. The code is broken and nothing indicates the problem of inconsistent calls. From the first sight, if we know nothing about the code, we can't say that something is wrong here. Despite that this code won't work, it will fail in the runtime. The worst possible thing. Why this is happening to us? What is the reason of the problem? The primary reason is that two functions create player and create board cause side effects. They change the state of the object. Another reason, and this is the consequence of the first reason, is that all the three functions share state. That state change it by two functions. Let's get rid of the side effects and look at the result.
The refactored version does not have any state anymore. There is nothing to share. Those two functions which mutated the state are now turned into pure functions which don't cause any side effects. They accept arguments and return the results, just as regular mathematical functions do. Now we don't need to keep in mind the right sequence of calls. You can't mess them. Let's try to do that. It won't compile. One call logically flows to another call. Now functions explicitly demonstrate that they are connected by logical data flow between them. Okay, I cheated on you a little bit. There is still a side effect and it hides in the start game method. This method doesn't return anything and it calls the mutating operation which is called start game. We don't know why the game class was implemented this way, and actually it doesn't matter. We can't avoid side effects totally. And it's fine. Mutating is a usual thing, especially at the external boundaries of a system, such as user interface or a database. So try to avoid mutating functions as much as possible. It makes your code much easier to read and understand, and thus more maintainable.